Right, well, let's talk about some of the personalities uh, that we saw in, in scrambling and indeed in trials itself. Um, now, you had one great hero. Tell us about him. Yeah, my boyhood hero was uh, Trish Sharp, who always raced with number 71 on his bikes. He raced the 250 Greaves and a 500 Triumph. Well, it was a Tribsa. It was a Triumph engine in a BSA frame with uh, an aerial swing arm and Norton fork. So it was very much a a bit so, but he was my great hero. The bikes were always immaculately presented and he always had a silky smooth riding style. I first saw Tris in uh, March 1961 when I was taken to my first scramble by my big brother and uh, he instantly became my hero and I remember going back home and got my push bike out of the shed and uh, made a number 71 up which I put on the push bike to, to emulate my great hero and, it, and the bicycle was a triumph as well so uh, I used to be able to replicate the noises the bike, the, his bike made. <laughs> well, it's odd, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, it, I can equate that to going to watch Speedway for the first time. And, and Bob Kilby was my big hero because my dad worked with his dad, etc., etc., and doing exactly the same. And um, uh, how odd that is, isn't it? You can sort of live your fantasy if you have a push bike. You can be a motorcycle racer. Oh, very much so, yeah. And the great thing with the book was that Tris was the very first pe person I interviewed to go in the book. So he starts on chapter one and there's reference to me seeing him in uh, March 61. So, uh, yeah, it seems funny that sort of 46 years later, you know, I'm going to, to interview my boyhood hero. Fantastic. And how were you with him when you saw him? Because, you know, when you get to meet your hero, it's a bit of a moment, isn't it? Oh, very much so, yeah. But he's a lovely chap. Uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that everyone I've, I've interviewed doing the uh, uh, profiles for the book really have been great enthusiasts and, and lovely people. You know, very friendly, very helpful, very hospitable. So it's been absolutely wonderful. Now, take us through some of the personalities. You mentioned Trish Sharp there. Um, Arthur Browning is one which springs to mind. Vic Eastwood is another one which comes to mind. And, you know, uh, Dave Goss, was it Dave Goss? Oh, Badger Goss. Badger Goss, yeah. yes, yeah, Brian Goss, is yeah, that right? Brian yeah. Goss, yeah. Brian Goss, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what sort of men were these? They were phenomenally talented racers, you know, get them on a motorbike and they were suddenly, a lot of people were fairly quiet, nondescript, uh, off a bike, but get them on a motorbike and they were, you know, really... <laughs> Something else, you know, a force of nature. Uh, Badger Goss, for instance, it seemed that he was usually on the back wheel of the Greaves more than he was had the front. You know, the front wheel was almost permanently up in the air. He was a he was wonderful for the crowd. You know, he was a very spectacular rider. And these sports weren't easy, were they? I mean, we're talking about pretty tough sport. If you're riding a motorcycle through, I don't know, a foot of mud on a cold November afternoon, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? Oh, absolutely not. No, you know, they certainly had to be very fit. Um, I know talking to Chris Horsfield, he was working um, at James at the time and he used to go out um, for a run two hours every morning before he started work. And this was sort of typical of people who were the top-notch scramblers at that time. You know, they did need to be very, very fit. And yet these were in the days when, you know, fitness wasn't the science that it is now, is it? I mean, th these were days when people, I don't know, used to turn up and play football after a couple of pints and have a few fags. You know, this, these were different days, weren't they? Oh, very much so, yeah. Yeah, but I think to the sort of uninitiated, most people saw scramblers racing on the Saturday and perhaps gave little thought to the all the preparation that went into that, not just through physical fitness, but the preparations of the bikes during the week as well. You know, they certainly were nothing like the reliable things they are now, you know, and most bikes needed stripping down on a regular basis, engines coming apart. So the people who rode them were usually pretty good mechanics as well. You know, a lot of them would have pursued world championship points going all the way around Europe and a lot had no mechanics travelling with them. You know, if the bike played up, they had to sort it out. And they were all round motorcyclists as well, weren't they? Uh, uh, one thinks of Arthur Browning, who went on to, to make a bit of a career on the Shale Sports Speedway. So these people knew how to ride motorbikes. Oh, crikey, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them were not just good scramblers, but they rode in trials during the winter. Um, a lot of them rode in international six days trials, uh, which was a combination of um, 
a matter of staying on time and riding perhaps 12 or 1300 miles over very rough terrain for six days. Very demanding. Um, and yeah, they were very, very good all round riders. They didn't just ride in one uh, aspect of the sport, but, uh, but all sorts of things. Now, not only have you produced this very excellent book, which I'm delighted to say has black and white photographs in, which they, they kind of ought to have, really. There are, there aren't any colour ones in there, I don't think, no. are there? No, which is fantastic. Uh, but you also write for Classic Motorcycle magazine, and, and there are a whole raft of magazines like this, aren't there? It regards, you know, buses and tractors and airplanes and things like this. Why are those magazines so popular, do you think, these days? I don't know. It seems to be the old thing of nostalgia is a big thing. And I think that's really what it uh, revolves around. Um, the Classic Motorcycle, for instance, is published by Morton's in Horncastle in Lincolnshire. And they've got 10 or a dozen various titles, uh, you know, from traction engines and old lorries, all sorts of things under their belts and all sell very, very well. And, you know, you go into any news agent and there's a stack of uh, magazines about all sorts of things so yeah nostalgia is a big thing I guess. Is it because the, the, the things that we use these days the motorcycles the cars the lorries the buses they're all a little bit clinical Do you, is that possibly the reason? I think it's very much the case you know where you've got a modern bike or car or whatever you know you stick petrol in it you turn the ignition on and you drive or ride it and that's usually where the association ends you know uh, whereas of course Years ago, you needed to be a bit more clued up mechanically because things did break down and they did go wrong. Although, on saying that, my brother and I used to travel hundreds of miles all around the West Country in his old XGPO van, and uh, we never took a tool with us, or there was never any RAC or AC, AA cover or anything like that. You know, we just travelled hundreds of miles in this old van. <laughs> If you had to have your choice of, the, of a, of a favourite motorcycle, which one would it be? I mean, there are hundreds to choose from, I guess, but um, would we be talking BSA? Would we be talking matchless? What would we be saying? I've always loved the little Greaves two-strokes. From the very first scramble I went to, I must admit, I always had a very much a soft spot for them. And um, my very first the trial, I, when I made my trials debut in 1970, one or two I had a 250 Greaves which was totally uncompetitive but yeah I've always had a very much a soft spot for Greaves from they were made in Thundersley in Essex uh, only a small concern just over 100 people working there run by Bert Greaves and his cousin Derry Preston Cobb but they um, carried Dave Bickers to European glory in uh, 60 and 61 people like Brian Goss and Trish Sharp rode them to huge you know wins all over the place See, there's another name. You've said Dave Bickers, and immediately I'm back in the 1960s watching Scrambling on television. It's extraordinary once you mention your name like that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, he was a hell of a rider, Dave. Funnily enough, I saw him last Friday, actually. I went to down memory lane at Barnstable, and, uh, and he was there, looking a bit older and a bit wider than he did in uh, <laughs> the early 60s. But, but yes, I mean, he was a phenomenal rider. And would you get characters... I mean, it would be easy to say it isn't the same as it used to be, but I guess from 30 years' time, people will be talking about the motocross stars of, of today in much the same way, I suppose, will they? I don't know. I have my doubts in as much that it's not brought into the Saturday afternoon uh, screens as it was sort of 40-odd years ago. I think in at that time, there were a lot of... of Kind of ordinary motorcyclists were also very keen on going to watch scrambles and trials and motorcycle events in general whereas now it probably isn't you know you go to a modern motocross meeting and there's probably more people in the pits than there are in the crowd and the name of your book is called what it's called off-road giants and it's published by veloci publishing at dorchester and it costs 19 pounds 99 pence <laughs>